Welcome to Quilting from the Heartland. I'm Charlene Jorgensen and today I'm going to take you on a voyage to the seaside. The quilts that we will be making today are sailboats and a child's room, a family room, or a fireside room at a resort are just a few of the places that these quilts would be nice in. The first quilt that I'm going to show you before getting started today is a small quilt. I made it for the kitchen at the lake cabin. I also made a set of pot holders to match it. The nautical fabrics and the quilting designs both complement the sailboats in this quilt. There's a variety of textures in the fabrics and there's different amount of backgrounds in each of them showing through. The boats are floating on quilted waves and then I repeated the red binding along the outside edge to re repeat the color that was used in the sails on the boats. The next example that I want to share with you is a collection of fabrics in it that were designed by Lynette Jensen. These fabrics worked out very nicely in this quilt. The boats are separated in this quilt by a large alternate block which gave me a nice area to quilt in a steering wheel. Then when you look closely at the sails in the, in the sailboats, you'll see that there are clouds quilted in uh, in a freeform style. Then there is a stippling outlining the clouds to enhance them. The boats have long gentle waves in them to make uh, long gentle wavy lines in them to make them look uh, more realistic and then the boats are sitting on high waves of water. When you look at the outside edge of this quilt you'll see that there are cables quilted in it to carry out the theme of this quilt. The next one that I want to show you is a sampler of sailboats. The size of this quilt is determined by the size of the blocks and the size of the sashing that's used in them. Also notice that the sails are all going in the same direction and that each one of them are different in this quilt. Well by now you know that it's possible to make this quilt in a couple of sizes. And I want to show to you first of all the the comparison in size of the blocks when working with this quilt. To my left I have a small version of it and these are the smaller sizes of templates of course from Pandora's box and then the larger one would just be the larger squares and actually four of these will equal this one and that gives you a good idea of how much bigger one is over the other one. The pattern shapes uh, are easy to work with because there's all straight edges and this would be a very good quilt for a beginner to start with because it is all straight edges and there aren't a lot of different shapes to work with. When cutting the fabric I have ahead of time placed two fabrics on top of each other and I have folded them, them in half over here and to save time we will straighten both of the uh, fabrics at one time. Then place the ruler up on top of those fabrics and line up the edge of the ruler down here and then turn the board so that it's easier to make that cut. Make sure that you allow plenty of room in your workspace so that you can freely turn your work as you're cutting. Now I like to use a rotary cutter when I cut all of my patterns and when starting to cut just push forward with your thumb and that exposes the blade. Then put your hand down on top of the ruler to hold it from sliding and then just gently follow the edge of the ruler and in one, one clean cut you have all of the fabric straightened at one time. Then turn your board and each time you finish cutting remember to close the blade so that you don't cut yourself. You'll notice that I have grips on the back of my ruler and that helps to stabilize it also when I'm cutting. Now when working today we're going to work with the larger shapes. Uh, first of all I will be using template E and place that up on top of the ruler to determine how wide you need to cut the strips and then move the ruler over so that the edge of the template matches the straightened edge of the fabric. Now we will be uh, cutting both of these at the same time so of course you'll save a lot of time doing it that way. 
Then just remove the, the template and we will cut another strip for the, the pieces that go into the, actually this is for the sail and then the background of the sail. Now we will move these strips onto a smaller uh, board because it's easier to turn your work as you're cutting. And bifold them up on top of the board like this. Now I didn't mention to you about where the bias should go in the block and so why don't I put this uh, shape up on here so you see where, it, where the bias is to go. You want the bias edge in here and that will maintain a straight outside edge of the block when you start to put the units together. So place the template on the uh, strips and line up the edge down here and then the long edge of the triangle will be the bias edge in the quilt. Release the blade and then just cut along the edge. And turn your mat letting the template and the fabric ride along so that you don't disturb it. That will help you to maintain some of the accuracy. And after you have cut one, then of course you would just cut uh, another one until you have gone completely ac across those strips. We won't cut any squares because those are so simple to cut. You would just cut a strip of fabric to, to the shape uh, that you want. Uh, one thing I want to talk about before going to the sewing machine is that the water has a directional print in it. And when cutting that, you want to make sure that the direction of the water is going in the direction that you want it. Also, this particular piece right here and the one up here that follows the edge of the sails was cut the same width as the F template. And I did cut this one a little bit longer than the actual block and then it was trimmed off when we get to that part. And we'll talk about that when we do get to the sewing machine. Something that I find very helpful to have uh, when I'm sewing is a flannel board to work on. And I do lay out all of the pieces on the flannel board so that when I get to the sewing machine, I know exactly what I want to do. And this is an example of what it might look uh, like before you start sewing. Well, let's get started now putting the pieces together. I want you to sew all of the seams with a scant fourth inch seam allowance and the reason you do that is to make up for the amount of fabric that's used in the seam line. And then use a hundred percent cotton thread to match the fabric for strength as well as care. When starting to put the quilt together, the first thing you do is to put the uh, half square triangles together. Now those are the easiest shapes to sew because they are exactly like each other. And I find it real helpful if I take the time to uh, iron the two pieces together. It seems like they cling together and then when I uh, send them through the machine, it's easier to maintain a straight seam as I'm sewing. And I don't use any pins uh, when I'm at this part uh, chain sewing these because it just takes extra time and really I find that they get in the way. I like to use an open toe or no uh, a foot that hasn't got a bridge across the front because it doesn't obstruct my view when I'm sewing. Then hold on to the thread when you start sewing so that it doesn't go down in the feed dogs. And see how that fabric clings together as I'm sewing? And pins just wouldn't have been necessary at all. And you would chain sew until you have enough for a whole sailboat. But before you start chain sewing, you need to give yourself a sewing test to make sure that your seam allowance is correct. And I'll take one of the sails down so that you can see uh, what it looks like. The next thing then you do is place the template down on top of that sewing square and see if it matches up. And that will help you uh, give, it will actually give you confidence to continue on because you'll know that your seam allowance is correct. After you have sewn the two pieces together that we, we did in the beginning here, then clip the threads and something that I do before I actually iron that seam open is I'll clip off the ears out here and I'll clip them at a 90 degree angle 
to the outside edge over here and this eliminates the bulk in the corner and by doing this before pressing it saves uh, a little bit time later. Then finger press the seams open and I do that ahead of pressing and that helps prevent any of those wells in the seam line. And then do it again on the right side and take the time to press it. Now if you don't have an ironing board attached to your sewing machine, you might like to have a portable one that you could probably put on a card table next to you. I find that if you have an ironing board convenient, then you're going to be more apt to iron as you go. Then after you have all of the sails uh, put together, you need to start attaching them together uh, into pairs of two. And you'll put those right side together, and of course then you'll get another factory going and start chainsawing those together. And again, I'm not going to pin them in place, but I will just um, put them under the presser foot. And don't do any back stitching, because it will create bulk and it will give you problems later. And just uh, follow the edge of the fabric with your presser foot. Now I have dialed uh, my machine so that it's set at a scant fourth inch seam allowance. And I won't do any more of those, but you see it would be easy for a beginner to do because it is all straight sewing. At this point, after you have sewn the sails together, I want to point out that the seam line uh, where the intersection comes right in here is a fourth of an inch from the edge of the pieces after they're sewing. Uh, after you've completed sewing them. And when you start attaching them to the strips, you want to sew over that intersection so that you have a nice uh, point on the right side. Something else that I will talk about before we go to the next step is that here we have already pieced the parts of the boat together and the sails will have been put together and then you start attaching this piece out here. And I think I've already mentioned one time that the water or the direction of the piece of fabric uh, under the uh, sailboat is going in a horizontal direction. Well now we'll move on to the next steps um, putting the boat together. In this, uh, on this flannel board the, the sails have been attached and al already the bottom part has been put on. And you'll see that we will put this particular seam in next. And I want to point out that this seam allowance right in here is a fourth of an inch from the edge. And we want to sew with that piece on top then. And the reason I want to do that is because that intersection is visible. When putting these pieces together, there is a couple of places that I want to, uh, to pin before sewing the seam. And the first one is right on the seam line between the, uh, the boat and the sail. And I'll put it a fourth of an inch from the edge on that seam. And then on the bottom seam, I'll do the same. And leave that pin standing, and then put another one on each side. And after these pins are in, then you just remove that standing pin. And then up here, we don't have to put another pin because there's nothing underneath to match to. A very nice pattern for a beginner to start with. And I'll put another one up here. Sometimes uh, it's helpful to use them, but whenever possible, I avoid them if I can. OK, just put your presser foot down. And when we come to this seam up here now, we'll make sure that we sew right over that intersection. And just as you approach the pins, check underneath to make sure that your fabric is laying nice and flat. And so when you approach them, you know, sew slowly so you don't sew over them. And if you do, it isn't probably going to matter because the shaft and the pin that I'm using is a tiny one. I like to use uh, silk pins instead of those larger ones. Now approaching this one, I'll guide the fabric in front of the needle with the stiletto holding it down and we'll get right on that point. And then sew to the other end. <clears throat> That's how easy it is to attach the sails to the background fabric. The next part then would be to just continue sewing uh, the rest of the sails. Well, we, you would do this seam and then this one over here and the block would be completed. And of course you would take the time to press this seam open like I showed you before. <clears throat> 
Then down to my side, I have a block that's a little farther along. And all that's left to do now is to ta attach the water on the bottom. And here again, I'll want to sew with this block on top because the intersection here is the one that I want to sew over and the one that I want visible when sewing. So you would put those right sides together and uh, match up the ends. And again, it won't be necessary to use pins because there's nothing on the bottom side that I have to match to. And again, not, not necessary to backstitch when you start. Because when you sew the sailboats to the background pieces that are the alternate blocks, uh, there will be another seam going across and that will give you the strength that's needed. And now when I get closer to this, I'll well, guide it again, making sure that that seam lays down nice and flat in front of the presser foot. This was a fun uh, class to get ready because I realized that there were so many different ways that we could make the boats uh, when starting to work with it. all it is to putting one of these together. Then after you have that particular seam done, again take the time to press the seam open and you're ready to go to the next step. And that would be to put the alternate blocks between them or put the sashing or however you wanted to finish it off. And like I said, the size of the quilt is determined by the alternate blocks you use or the width of the stash sashing. I have in front of me a sample of the small sampler quilt and we have already attached the sashing between the boats and the border is on. And the quilt sandwich has already been put in place. Uh, between the layers I have a low loft batting and I like to use the low, la low loft especially for wall quilts when it, because it's so light. I also like to use it because it's easy to hand quilt and then it drapes so nice on beds if you're making uh, larger projects. So that's uh, probably my favorite batting to use for uh, just about everything I do. After you have got your quilt sandwich laid out and a quilt sandwich is the bottom layer is of course the back of your quilt and then you have the batting and then the pieced top on, on the top. Now there are three different ways that you can uh, connect the quilt sandwich together and one of them would be to use safety pins to attach the three layers together. You would just insert a pin and put them uh, all over the quilt top and that would hold the quilt sandwich together. Another way you could baste in a diagonal direction going across the, the quilt a couple of times and then some horizontal and vertical basting could be done. Then there is another way that's been become quite popular recently and that's to use a basting gun. And that's a very simple thing to do. And there's something that I want to point out as I'm doing this. Uh, sometimes people say, well, the fabric will shift uh, when you use a basting gun because the tie on it or the little uh, clips aren't short enough and your fabric will shift. Well, to avoid that, what I do is take, insert the needle and then come out about a fourth of an inch away from it. And when you pull the trigger and release that, uh, the uh, clip, you'll see that the fabric now can no longer shift and that stitch will keep it in place. And you just simply do that all over the quilt top and then it's ready to be quilted. Then in this one, of course, I would, because each of the boats are different, we would probably put some clouds up here and they wouldn't all be in the same place. We would put some water down in the bottom. And for the smaller ones, there are stencils that you can use uh, for the waves on those. And then just do some creative things yourself. Now on the larger one, I used, I think I mentioned that I used a steering wheel in the alternate box and that certainly added to the theme of what I was doing. After you have your quilt 
uh, completely quilted, it's ready to have the binding put on it. And I have a piece of work that is already quilted and ready to have the binding put on. This one is going to be a placemat uh, when it's finished. And we haven't uh, put the clouds in it yet, but I wasn't able to get all of that done. When making the binding for this quilt, what we're working with is a piece of fabric that's two inches wide, and then we have ironed it in half. And it will be put on the right side first, and then we'll bring it back to the back side. Notice that the binding is folded on a diagonal here, and then we have pressed it back about a fourth of an inch, and that gives us a nice uh, beginning. And when we come all the way around to the back side, we'll slip the binding in there, and that'll give us a nice ending. When starting to put the binding on, you would start sewing about this far in. And if you have to use a lot of binding, make sure that the seam line doesn't fall on the corner because it's harder to miter a corner if that should happen. So we'll now start attaching the binding. Actually, it doesn't really matter if you start the binding uh, on the back or front. I just happen to prefer putting it on the front side. We'll just line up the edge of the binding with the straight edge of the quilt that's already been uh, quilted. Notice that before putting the binding on, we have stitched along the outside edge of the quilt, and that's to keep the layers from shifting uh, when we're adding the binding on. Again, using a scant fourth inch seam allowance when sewing this seam, and I'm going to stop a fourth of an inch from the edge when I uh, get to the corner. Right up here is where I want to stop a fourth of an inch from the edge. And I'm using a white thread so that you can see where my sewing is. And when you get to the corner, stop with the needle down and then back up a couple of stitches. Now we will take the, the quilt out and we will turn it to readjust the fabric. Now, to miter the corner, it's really a simple process to do, and I'll try to explain it as plain, plainly and easy as I can. Just fold the fabric in half in a diagonal like this, and line up the edge of the quilt with the straight edge of the binding. And then hold this fold down with your pointer finger on your left hand, and then create the miter with your right hand, like that, and hold it in place, and then start sewing from the end. Just move it under the presser foot. Now I'm not going to back stitch. just start sewing from the end, drop the presser foot like that, and then starting on the edge, continue sewing. And you would repeat that same process around the whole edge of the quilt. This is my favorite way to put a binding on a quilt. Now I'm going to stop at this part in a little bit, and then I'm going to show you how to turn it to the other side and how the miter looks when it's on. Now you would use, of course, a red thread if you were doing this, because you wouldn't want um, all these white threads to show in your work. Okay, when turning this over, Put it to the back side, and an automatic miter is created when you do that. Hold this one down, and you'll see that the bulk on, or when you do it yourself, you'll feel that the bulk on the top is on one side, and on the bottom, the bulk will be on the opposite side. It's a very nice way to uh, finish off the edge. Also, after you get around to the other side of the quilt, then this one would just fit inside here when you get to the end. See how that would go? And then that would just fold over to the back side like that. Something else that helps me at this point when I'm uh, doing the binding, you know, we're always used to using pins when we're doing this. I like to use a binding clip to hold it in place. 
And those you'll probably remember were the hair pins that you used to make those little pin curls with. Just hold your fabric down like that and you don't have to worry about those pins sticking you all the time. And it's also easier to, to hold in your lap. And just hold those clips. Those clips will hold it in place as you're working. And then when you turn it over on the back side, you'll sew along in the ditch. After you have the binding attached, then it's time to start sewing along the outside edge. And I'm going to show you how I like to make the knots before starting to sew that seam. When putting the knot together, I use, of course, the thread, and I use it in a single instead of double, and wrap the thread around the end of the needle about three times, and then snug it up underneath your right hand between your uh, pointer finger and your other and your thumb, and then just pull it down to the end. And that gives you a nice uh, knot to start with. And when sewing the seam, you would just pick up right along the edge there, and you would go up underneath this fabric and just continue sewing along the outside edge until you have gone completely around. And when you get to the corner, of course, you've got to uh, make sure that you have the miter in there real nice. Now, it's been fun being captain of the ship today, showing you how to make all the different boats. And now you'll be able to navigate and do your own.